Good evening, everybody. On behalf of ISCM Kolkata branch, I uh, welcome all of you to join this webinar. Today we have a uh, very, uh, very good uh, speaker today. First speaker will be Dr. Uh, Saswati Sina. He is our senior consultant at AMRI Amri Hospital. And she is, she is one of the, uh, I think, uh, right now in COVID area, the OAS he has treated uh, the patient. And there was one very long, means basically a very uh, uh, patient was there more than, I think, one and a half months. And that patient was having too, too many difficulties. Before that, actually, we had some pessimism about the COVID-19 getting ventilated from across the, not only India, across the world. But Saswati, Dr. Saswati and her team has shown that kind of courage as well as a kind of uh, best treatment effort that actually allow that patient, relatively young patient, to survive that. And also, uh, she did a uh, few patients with the ECMO. So that's why she is one of the best. And not only that, recently she had also uh, got the award from Swangbad Patidin, the best doctor's award from Calcutta and in quite younger age. Okay. So in this context, that I want to say about Dr. Sarsati that right now in the COVID area, we have seen that the uh, women administrator or women doctors or whatever, they are leading than their counterpart. So it's really a pleasure to be, uh, basically I, I invite her to start. And But before that, there are Dr. Tonmay just has not joined Dr. Tonmay. Uh, uh, I think she, he will shortly join. He is senior consultant as well as director of critical care medicine at Medica Super Speciality Hospital. Today he will moderate that session. And after that, there are Dr. Orpon is there. Dr. Orpon is also senior consultant at Medica Critical uh, Medica Hospital. And not only that, he has very keen interest in the ECMO. And I think uh, Orpon is was also our a president of the ECMO Society of India. And every year he used to uh, do some ECMO conference and yet I think that is very resourceful uh, conference as well as meeting whoever is interested, they can join that year. And after that, Dr. Orindam Kaur, Dr. Orindam was, uh, was my colleague in Medica Super Speciality Hospital. He is also senior consultant in critical care medicine and leading in ICU, I think, uh, in, in charge in the Calcutta Hospital as well as in the Bellevue Hospital. And he is the present uh, secretary elect in ISCCM Mumbai. So his tenure will start uh, by uh, 2021 February. So I welcome all of you. And without any further delay, because Dr. Tonmay has not joined, so I will request Dr. Saswati to present his one interesting case was going through ECMO therapy, and I think that will the past case and followed by the later on. Once Dr. Tonmay will join, I will hand over the platform to Dr. Tonmay. Dr. Saswati, please. Thank you, uh, Shoranda, for the kind introduction. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it is my privilege to present the story of a young lady whom we treated about a month ago. And uh, she was a 24-year-old girl with no known comorbidities in the past. And uh, she presented to us on 17th of May in the early evening with high-grade fever, headache, and cough of five days duration prior to admission. She also had been having several episodes of vomiting for four days, and uh, for which she had taken some antibiotics at home. and. Uh, she complained of shortness of breath for two days, but more since a few hours prior to admission. She had no history of travel anywhere, of course, because we were already into lockdown for about a month and a half or any contact with any family member who had traveled anywhere. And none of her family members had similar symptoms at that present moment. Uh, when the emergency medical officer called me, this girl was already quite restless in the emergency. She was febrile and had a significant uh, sinus tachycardia of 147 per minute. Her blood pressure was 130 over 70. She was very tachypneic. And uh, they said that they had recorded a saturation of 34% on room air uh, in the emergency room. So they put her on a non-rebreathing mask and they transferred her to the ICU. 
Upon arrival to the ICU, she was a little bit obtunded, quite restless, and uh, they recorded a saturation of 50% on a non-rebreathing mask. She was trying to remove the mask repeatedly and was very breathless. And ABG done at that time showed a pH of 7.15, uh, carbon dioxide of 35, uh, severe oh, acidosis and in view of these findings and her clinical picture uh, she was uh, immediately intubated and ventilated and uh, she was started with on an FIO2 of uh, 1 a tidal volume of 6 ml per kg, a respiratory rate of 35 per minute. And PEEP was gradually titrated up to 15 centimeters of water. She was sedated and paralyzed and also started on an uh, midazolam fentanyl and atracurium infusions. She had high airway pressures. Her plateau pressure with these above settings was already 30 and a driving pressure of 15. All her routine investigations were sent, and uh, including the cultures. And at that time, we had just about started seeing few patients with COVID. So uh, not only was her endotracheal aspirate sent for a biofire, but it was also sent for COVID-19. Uh, she was started on broad spectrum antibiotics pending investigations and uh, other supportive medications apart from uh, whatever ventilation and the uh, sedative infusions she was on. And uh, she was started on enoxaparin in a prophylaxis dose at that point in time. But we knew we were facing an uphill task because uh, of her severity of her hypoxemia. So this was the chest x-ray on presentation. And uh, although it's a portable x-ray, the quality is uh, not very good, but showed extensive infiltrates with just a little bit of aeration probably in the right lower zone. But otherwise, there were infiltrates all over. So on three hours of these settings, her saturation remained 69 to 70% uh, on an FiO2 of uh, 1 and PEEP of 50 centimeters of water. Sorry for the typo. And uh, so we decided to turn her prone at that time. It was already about uh, 8, 8.30 p.m. on a Sunday evening. And uh, we were not getting anywhere. So we spoke to the father uh, of the patient and uh, explained him about the severe hypoxemia. And we uh, turned her prone around that time. Around midnight, after four hours in the prone position with the same ventilatory settings on an FiO2 of 1 and PEEP of 15, her ABG hadn't changed much. Uh, the pH was still low, uh, PCO2 of 64. Her PF ratio was still 48. So the father was counseled again regarding the severity of the illness, a possibility that we might wait for a few more hours. But if things did not take a turn for the better, then ECMO was probably the only thing which we were uh, looking at because there was, uh, there was hardly any room to maneuver as far as a ventilatory settings is concerned. Uh, these were the routine investigations. Uh, so... A white cell count of 11,500, a platelet of 4.7 lakhs. Not much significant in the biochemistry. So a normal urea creatinine, marginally elevated AST. Uh, her D-dimer was 2.69 and her ferritin was 1,060. An echo done before we turned her prone showed a good biventricular systolic function and an ejection fraction of 65%. By next morning, we got the lower respiratory biofire, which showed a methicillin sensitive staph aureus. So her antibiotics were de-escalated and uh, her SARS-CoV-2 tested positive. So even after 16 hours in prone position, the saturation had barely come up from 70% to about 82 to 84%. And the PF ratio was almost unchanged, uh, just about 52. So we were almost nearing 20 to 24 hours post admission and uh, she met the criteria basically with uh, optimizing the ventilatory support a neuromuscular blockade um, titration of peep and she, uh, her murray score which we calculate depending upon the severity of hypoxemia the level of peep the lung compliance and uh, the number of quadrants infiltrated on the chest x-ray. So she had a Murray score of 3.8. Uh, 
and family fi finally the family uh, did agree for ecmo and uh, vino venus ecmo was initiated just about 24 hours after her admission and um, she had a drainage cannula which was placed in the femoral vein and uh, a return cannula into the right ij and the ventilatory settings after initiation of ecmo and once her um, saturation etc improved uh, we lowered the tidal volume to 3 ml per kg because now was the time when the lungs needed to uh, be removed from the injurious effect of the high airway pressures so the peep was reduced to 10 and a respiratory rate of about 12 and uh, so she stabilized to a certain extent for the first three days uh, but after that we saw that uh, on the day four there was a significant worsening of her lung compliance a repeat x-ray showed a complete opacification of the left hemithorax we did a point of care ultrasound no effusion it appeared to be a collapse which did not improve with uh, changing the humidification thorough suctioning and all of that and uh, because she had a seven size endotracheal tube it was difficult to and also because of the COVID 19 we were thinking twice before uh, definitely deciding whether to go ahead with a bronchoscopy at that point in time so we were left with no option but to uh, expedite the tracheostomy. Normally in a COVID-19 patient, it's recommended to delay the tracheostomy as much as possible to reduce the exposure to the, uh, of the healthcare personnel to the infection. But uh, since things were not getting better, it was decided to go ahead with a percutaneous tracheostomy, which was done uh, taking all possible precautions. And luckily our ENT surgeon, he agreed uh, to come to our rescue at that point in time. And even despite the tracheostomy and tracheal toileting, the lung continued to remain white on the left side. So on day nine, uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy was done and it showed a hyperemic mucosa of the left lower low with thick mucus plugs which were suctioned out. Following which, uh, over the next 24 hours, there was a significant improvement in the patient's lung compliance. And uh, we repeated an X-ray, which definitely shows an improved aeration. Um, so the left side seems to have opened up quite quite well, and her oxygenation also significantly improved, as well as the lung mechanics. She had a new fever for which uh, all the cultures were sent. Um, the bronchial lavage was negative. The blood culture which was treated appropriately with antibiotics. All her invasive lines were changed. And on since day 10 onwards, we had a significant improvement in the gas exchange. So gradually, we were able to increase the tidal volume. Her neuromuscular blockade was stopped. After a uh, brief period of about 12 hours of restlessness, and uh, she seems to she seemed to follow commands and was quite awake at that point of time. And from the, the initiation of uh, weaning of ECMO was uh, started. And on day 12, we were able to decannulate her from ECMO. Over the next few days, she was gradually weaned off the ventilator. And we started her on physiotherapy and uh, aggressive mobilization. And on 19th day after admission, we could decannulate her tracheostomy. Uh, following which uh, she was mobilized and physiotherapy was started. And on day 22, we were able to uh, discharge her and she was alert, oriented, uh, saturating 99% on room air, hemodynamically stable. Although she had some neuromuscular weakness, some proximal muscle weakness, uh, she was requiring assistance for feeding and mobilization at that point in time. But we are, I was very, very happy to see her walking into my OPD today morning itself. So uh, just briefly before Dr. Orpun takes over regarding uh, ECMO and scope and challenges in the pandemic situation. So the ECMO in COVID-19, the WHO has issued interim guidelines and uh, they recommend transfer of patients with the most refractory hypoxemia with centers with expertise in ECMO and uh, also has put forward the criteria uh, based on which a patient can be referred for ECMO depending upon the PF ratio if it remains less than 60 for more than six hours or less than 50 for greater than three hours 
or a refractory respiratory acidosis, pH of less than 7.2 with a PCO2 of greater than 80 for more than six hours. This has to happen after optimization of ventilation, neuromuscular blockade, appropriate PEEP, prone positioning, and pulmonary vasodilators. We did not have uh, access to inhaled nitric oxide, so that is something which we did not do for our patient. So all the above criteria plus a Murray score of greater than two merits a consideration for ECMO. Now, obviously, some con uh, contraindications, if the patient has an advanced age, a lot of comorbidities, multi-organ involvement, advanced neurological uh, involvement, or prolonged CPR. So the likelihood of reversal is less. So in these patients may not be uh, good candidates for ECMO. As far as the data which has been reported from all over the world, there have been several case series, and uh, they have reported a uh, very grim uh, picture to start with. Basically, the initial reports from China and Europe had uh, said that the mortality was greater than 80% if the patient with COVID-19 was sick enough to merit ECMO. But the recent estimates are a mortality anywhere between 17 to 57%. Although a lot of the patients in these case series continued to be on ECMO by the time the reports were published. So if we come to our patient, she was young with no major comorbidities. She had just a single organ dysfunction. She had refractory hypoxemia despite uh, optimization of ventilation. Uh, we put her on ECMO uh, within 24 hours, so ventilated for less than seven days, and she had a Murray score of greater than three. So she almost fulfilled all criteria, and we were left with no other option to save her but to put her on ECMO. Although there are certain caveats which we need to keep in mind, especially in a pandemic situation, ECMO is a very resource intensive uh, treatment modality, not only for the family because it's still quite expensive. A lot of families may not be able to afford and also for the medical team, uh, it's resource intensive as far as equipment, manpower and all of these things are concerned. It needs a lot of expertise and the contagiousness of the COVID-19 virus poses a significant risk to the healthcare workers. The procedure of cannulation is extremely challenging with the PP and the, all the precautions, and it can be risky, especially except that a lot of us are not equipped with negative, proper negative isolation rooms. A lot of complications may be associated, like hemorrhage, infections, and thrombosis, especially in a uh, pro-thrombotic state like COVID-19. All over the world, significantly longer durations of ECMO have been reported for COVID-19 patients for as long as three to six weeks. So supporting a patient for this long, again, becomes very resource intensive. And in resource limited settings like our countries, in a pandemic situation, our priority should be to ensure adequate oxygen, adequate monitored beds and pulse oximeter available rather than such resource intensive interventions. So to conclude, it is a life-saving modality in case of refractory hypoxemia and sometimes ends up saving valuable lives. But we, what we must remember, it, it is not a resource to be rushed to the front lines in a pandemic situation when the basic resources of ours are stretched to the maximum. Uh, I would like to end by thanking uh, the team, which makes it possible. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sashwati, for your uh, case presentation. Very excellent presentation and a very interesting case where a uh, patient was successfully put on ECMO and also weaned off uh, successfully as well as patient went home. So I think important points you have mentioned that uh, in COVID situation, what we have seen is that it takes time to recover. So uh, even on the ventilator, even if they are not going on ECMO, they are taking time two weeks almost up to two weeks, sometimes three weeks, take us to me, maybe a month. Same with ECMO. I mean, even if they go on ECMO, we have seen that the duration of ECMO therapy is longer than usual ARDS. So uh, shall we take, uh, I was told by a bit early, is that right? Sorry. It didn't hear you. No, uh, uh, there are a few questions actually. Okay. I was told by Dr. Panja that you would yes, take. Yes, the... I wanted to leave a little bit early, but that's okay. If you want to take it in the end, that's fine. But... No, we can take some, some questions now, and then if further questions come up, we can take again. Okay. Sure. Okay. 
So first question was that uh, whether you used a steroid as well as uh, along with neuromuscular blockage, uh, uh, you know, together. And what was the uh, was there any concern regarding critical illness, neuropathy, myopathy, and all that? We didn't use steroid, and uh, just to put things into perspective, at that time the recovery trial was not yet out. <laughs> Uh, we were not using steroids routinely at that point in time for our COVID uh, ARDS patients. So she was our second patient, basically the one with bad ARDS. So we were, we did not use steroids. We did use neuromuscular blockade. And uh, that itself had left quite a bit of uh, neuropathy. Uh, but luckily, over the next, uh, we were not, I mean, her weaning from the ventilator was not very prolonged after decannulation uh, from ECMO. So just about seven days or so. Okay, and what was the duration of uh, using neuromuscular block? Uh, Ten days. Ten days. Okay, yeah. I mean, that is what we have seen our experience, in our experience as well, that uh, the duration is longer than normally. Yes, yes. We tried to, but we couldn't do it earlier. Mm -hmm. And then again, uh, congratulations. A uh, lot of good feedback coming up. That excellent presentation, good Thanks. presentation, and all that. The next question is that. Whether what antiviral, uh, uh, whether he received, uh, she received any uh, tocilizumab or antiviral or any other drug no, for no, uh, for Corona. COVID. No, we didn't. We didn't. So she didn't receive any no. tocilizumab. Yeah. No cytosol. No, no antivirals. No, nothing. Okay, okay. So that means that I mean she got better with just uh, so she just got better with organ support. Is yes. that right? Right. Uh, and, uh, basic ICU care and time, I think. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, we don't know whether the other drugs we are using now they work or not. Uh, obviously, tocilizumab we have used quite a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Remdesivir we have started using as well. Mm -hmm. Cytosol also we have used. So yes, I mean, uh, I think more questions will come up uh, as we go on. So we will uh, take that. Sure. So next, uh, so thank you. Next presentation, we've got Dr. Arpan Chakraborty. He is uh, the senior consultant, cardiac anesthesia and ECMO team, uh, Medical Specialty Hospital, and he will uh, talk on uh, his experience uh, with ECMO in COVID situation. Over to you, Arpan. Uh, thank you, Sashwatiti. You have started like Sewag, and uh, uh, for me, it is very difficult to carry after this kind of. Uh, success story you have put on us but we have to continue to support all of the covid patients and uh, obviously we have a lot of scopes and a uh, few challenges also so whenever i speak about uh, ecmo in any forum i speak uh, as a spokesperson from my ecmo team and uh, obviously i was a uh, past president of ecmo society of india and we have a founder member of ecmo kolkata so this is my ecmo team and without this uh, and you probably better know we can't run uh, a successful ECMO program without an ECMO team. So we have started our ECMO program in 2014. And uh, if you found an ECMO uh, availability center map uh, in uh, the published by ELSO, so you'll found ourselves in the, uh, as a medical super specialty hospital as an ECMO availability center for COVID. So uh, obviously this is very basic question, what is ECMO? It's an uh, use of extracorporeal membrane circulation, gaseous exchange uh, for a temporary life support and reversible pulmonary. And uh, this is the uh, blue blood. I'm taking it out, uh, putting through the oxygenator. Uh, the oxygen is going in and the carbon dioxide is going out and uh, the red blood is going inside the body. So we are just uh, delivering the oxygen to the uh, tissue level. And obviously two modes, that is VV and VA. VV is for primarily for the lungs and VA is for both lungs and the heart. Uh, uh, surprisingly, and uh, uh, till date, the data shows the 95% uh, 90, of the ECMO used in COVID, in spite of the high incidence of uh, pulmonary embolism and other um, uh, cytokine storms, the 95% of the COVID patients received venovenous ECMO worldwide. So uh, this was a very old uh, 2012 study where ECMO was uh, established as a technique of uh, oxygenation in case of uh, ARDS, severe ARDS. So sometimes uh, uh, our ECMO survivors, uh, ECMO, uh, they ask me, sir, what you have done to me? What is your actual job, sir? I told, sir, uh, uh, I'm an ECMO consultant. So, okay, that is fine. What is your do actually? 
So I found in the early part of the uh, lockdown, there's a nice boy who was supplying uh, food to uh, uh, as a Zomato delivery person. And he was very uh, in a smiling face. That was very popular as a uh, part of the lockdown grief. He was very uh, happy with his job. So I uh, got the answer from him. I do the oxygen delivery. I'm an oxygen delivery boy. So uh, that is my, uh, I want to present myself as an oxygen delivery boy. I do supply oxygen to the customer, that is to the tissues directly. So uh, ELSO has published an uh, extracorporeal life support organization interim guidelines uh, and uh, uh, that is published in SAIO journal, which I have been uh, contributed this uh, uh, from Medical Super Specialty Hospital, Kolkata. And uh, uh, this has showed a proper guidelines. And to us, if you say the, what are the challenges uh, in ECMO in COVID-19, I'll contribute to this uh, four uh, issues like ECMO in pandemic, whether there's a basic question, the ECMO should be used in pandemic or it should be as a frontliner, it should be as a backliner, what is this role? But I will remind all of you, all of the viewers that an ECMO in adult respiratory failure is evident and is the, uh, uh, the most evidence-based medicine of ECMO on adult respiratory failure came out in a pandemic scenario that is in H1N1, the famous CESAR trial came out. So ECMO cannot be used in pandemic or it cannot be uh, uh, put on pandemic. That is a misnomer. I don't believe in that. I think people are not. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, establish that in my subsequent talks. Next is the uh, manpower. Obviously, we need a trained manpower. But if you see in Kolkata, in the Eastern India, because of our constant endeavor of this ECMO awareness programs, this ECMO has become a good uh, uh, training, uh, uh, proper training uh, to the all critical care people, critical care technologists, perfusionists, and to the all the cardiac surgeons. It the manpower, uh, the ECMO awareness has gone up in the, uh, uh, the the nursing staff, that is the staffs who are working in the at least in the bigger corporate hospitals of the Kolkata. So manpower will not be a problem, and ECMO machine is probably available even in all the hospitals of Kolkata and. To, uh, my gratitude, to my gratitude to my uh, uh, chief minister. And she was the first lady I uh, heard her uh, around two months back where she ordered 10 ECMO machines when the, this pandemic starts. So ECMO is no longer a uh, backline uh, uh, support in this kind of pandemic. So you have to uh, keep in mind. Third is the resource. Yes, obviously it is resource intensive, but if you see, a proning a patient of a 120 kilo and one patient was there in 175 kg proning of a 175 kg patient is also a resourceful job you need eight people to uh, prone uh, him or her so ecmo for a regular center who is uh, doing an ecmo for a program for last three to five years that resource intensive thing might not be very uh, a very uh, hindrance for ecmo in pandemic Fourth is the finance. Yes, obviously the finance is higher. As you told, as uh, Dr. Shashwati told, the finance is a problem. Who is going to give that finance, that pandemic scenario, there is an economic slowdown, everything is there. But I'm telling you that finance is, uh, the, is a problem because we don't use it very regular way. If we do it regularly, people will come, people will invest, and there will be a competition in the market, and this cost of ECMO will come down. And at least it is assured that it will, this four thing will give a good outcome of ECMO in COVID-19. That is evident from our uh, uh, patients coming out of ECMO. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, this is a very good chart which shows the, how the ECMO should be used in pandemic. We have used, that is in our interim consensus guidelines, the ECMO should be used in four uh, capacity model. Like, if the, your hospital is running with the conventional capacity, like within the uh, capacity it is running, judicious ECMO case selection should be there. You should offer both VV, VA, and also the ECPR. But if you are, your system is running with an expanded capacity, then you should try to maximize capacity to outcome. VV, VA in younger, not any ECPR or VA ECMO for other non-COVID patients. And if you slips to the 
capacity tire to an expanded capacity close to saturation then you restrict your ecmo selection criteria you should restrict them to the vv ecmo in younger single organ failure covid 19 patients currently all the hospitals probably is uh, in between this capacity tire one and between the capacity tire two so you can always support any younger ecmo patients and also the healthcare workers i i should uh, mention it repeatedly that all the healthcare workers should be treated till uh, 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 till they get the best treatment so within this capacity tire one and capacity tire two this kind of ecmo therapy should be provided in younger and single organ covid 19 patients and lastly the way the crisis capacity is there then you can tell we am capacity is overwhelmed the patients are uh, uh, overwhelm in our uh, emergency they are in the roads so then you go for a triage for icu admissions don't give ecmo to that patient in the crisis capacity one but here we have uh, uh, we did a mistake that no nowhere we have written that retrieval uh, in any of the group i think retrieval can be done in the conventional capacity and capacity tire one this is the very clumsy side i know but this is for the staff safety staff safety should be kept in mind when you put the patients on ecmo obviously uh, all the body fluid handling and all these things should be done with proper pp we should all know ecmo center should have protocols and guidelines for handling medical wastes everybody should wear pp routine exhaust gas negative pressure isolation room we should know and we should read it as a uh, proper staff safety guidelines to, for everybody's use this is another thing I want to show uh, before uh, the initial part of the, our uh, ECMO pro, uh, things in the COVID-19. We are using a, a filter at the exhaust of our ECMO oxygenator. But soon, we, this paper came out where they told the SARS-CoV-2 does not spread through ECMO or dialysis membrane. So we are not using any exhaust, uh, any uh, filter at the exhaust of the ECMO oxygenator. So this is the uh, very good chart where uh, uh, ECMO should be provided with proper facility, system, personnel, equipment, and with proper ethics. That should ensure the patient safety, quality, and staff safety. That will maximize the benefit. And this slide actually shows how you maximize the benefit of a patient on ECMO on COVID-19. So before going to our uh, challenges, we should know how the ECMO which was practiced for last six years, how it is different in COVID. All the reports, are, all the points are important because what uh, Dr. Sina told that all resource and technique like proning, your HFNO, your all the mechanical, uh, uh, pre-mechanical ventilation uh, procedure should be followed before putting on ECMO. Second is ECMO should be done in a cohorted place. It is not your regular place like we uh, normally do ECMO in our city as ITU. But nowadays we are doing the ECMO in, in the proper Corona ward and it is in the cohorted place because you cannot mix your COVID and non-COVID patients. Third is that you should keep in mind the utmost staff safety. Fourth is the remote monitoring should be available. It should be a camera uh, uh, over there or should be EICU facilities if possible. Fifth is the careful aerosol generating procedure. What uh, Dr. Sina told the bronchoscopy, uh, she uh, what she could have done on the third day, she actually uh, postponed it to 10th day. So uh, that might be uh, contributed for the long stay, but it should be careful uh, enough because I'm, appre I, I'm appreciating her thing because this can uh, put uh, uh, the endangered uh, uh, your healthcare officials. Well, that is the handling of membranes. All the membranes, like all the oxygenators, all the um, uh, dialysis membranes, should be uh, handled properly because if there is any crack, there is a spillage, you should consider it as a, uh, a proper spillage criteria. Last one is the decannulation is as important as cannulations because we decannulate. Sometimes uh, the patient is doing fine, then we decannulate, or sometimes it's an post-mortem decannulation you have to keep in mind that post-mortem decannulation if you do it should be cautiously done as you have done the cannulation with properly worn ppe and obviously the ethics and pandemic you should plan for your futility but reminding you all people that already last uh, i think the uh, uh, yesterday uh, in North America, they have done a bilateral lung transplant on a patient of a hundred days of ECMO run. 
so futility is as your facilities are available if they can do a bilateral lung transplant we may get some patients where all the ecmo cannot be uh, uh, removed but the patient is doing fine he is having single organ things maybe the future will tell us we can go for a lung transplant things and last one that i have to tell you and we know all of our practicing that no relatives are around when you are counseling the ecmo patient that is very much typical in covid scenario because either they are in quarantine and all these things we are taking all the gadgets like email like for, uh, whatsapp we are taking all the consents through that where to keep all the records with our uh, proper future safety and usage so these are the things ecmo how it is different in covid and obviously we have some uh, data that uh, dr sina was telling uh, this is the last 4th july data uh, in euro also they have published the 1312 ecmo cases in 167 centers still 141 is running and 701 has quinned off so almost a 55% winning they have showed as and uh, this data is much better than what was there in the china where they have shown that more than 80% of the patients would not be winned off initially so uh this was the uh, yesterday's uh, first page of uh, times of india and they have shown 43% of our covid-19 deaths in india in 30 to 59 years of age band so this shows we have not used enough ecmo because we have to we have to uh, 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 give the adequate chance to this younger age group they are between 30 to 59 even i i fall between in them so i think the ecmo should come up it should not be a uh, front liner but it should not be the last resort of usage so uh, this was from my ecmo society thing we have done till 16 cases in india 14 vv 2 va and 2 retrievals by the ground transport and in the medica we did 7 cases till now and obviously 6 uh, out of the vv and 1 in va and we have transported one patients by ground transport so this is my small uh, uh, thing when the seven patients were ventilation to ecmo was 32 hours uh, mean pf ratio is 0.6 obviously all of the patients except one uh, uh, the prone before ecmo renal replacement therapy is about 40% which is very high myocarditis is about 20% patient shock liver found in 20% cerebral issues uh, this needs separate mentions because covid encephalopathy is not that uncommon which is found in 40% patients circuit thrombosis we uh, uh, unluckily we get one case of circuit thrombosis in the mid night and bleeding dic cytokine storm in more than 20 uh, in the 20% patients so what are the challenges we get uh, in ecmo in covid these four challenges i think uh, it is well um, explained by dr sina that is uh, first is the uh, early mods uh, classically in h1n1 patients we see the hypoxia the patient is hypox remain hypoxic for first 24 hours and next 48 hours then the multi organ sets in but here every organs gets uh, in problem in a simultaneous way so early mods when your lungs is bad you don't expect your kidney is not bad so it is early mods which is settling in the covid that is a problem and that's a real learning curve of an ecmo in covid that when you are giving for a single lung may not be the patient in single organ dysfunction he might have that kind of thing in the kidney they might have that kind of thing in the brain he might have that kind of thing in the intestines also second is the thrombosis we know there's a very high thrombosis rate uh, found in the uh, chinese uh, data where they, uh, almost they have changed the circuit twice or thrice but that data didn't reciprocate it in uh, european and north american experience it came down because they have increased the higher uh, uh, anticoagulation level but the thrombosis chance is much more than Uh, the circuit thrombosis any thrombosis in the body anywhere like your dvt your pulmonary embolism things are much more common in ecmo uh, ecmo in covid third one what we dr banerji was telling it's prolonged course don't expect any patient will come out within the first week i think the only one case in euro also study they reported the uh, the ecmo was out uh, uh, within four days the mean ecmo duration is 12 to 14 days Uh, i was reading a canadian study uh, they have uh, the mean ecmo duration is 14 to 16 days so if your mean ecmo duration is 14 to 16, 16 days 2 to 3 weeks your stay in the hospital goes to 4 to 5 weeks at minimum and fourth is the most dreaded thing cytokine storm 
it is ha it can happen at any point of time of your ekmoran and classically from your mumbai experiences uh, our, uh, our colleagues dr pranay has told us that uh, he found a uh, two uh, cases of cytokine storm at the on the day of 9 or 8th uh, or 9th uh, day on an otherwise stable vv ekmo and they lost the patient so these four problems uh, uh, constitutes the main problem in the ekmo in the covid so i'm just uh, uh, um, sharing my uh, uh, challenges what we face regarding this number first one the challenge is the retrieval by ground transport this is a challenge because uh, with you have to be prepared for your staff safety pattern that i am very much uh, worried about because you cannot put all of your staff in the uh, endangering uh, covid so you have to take a uh, utmost precautions and uh, you are you are going for a retrieval and you have calculated the patient in the other hospitals with proper pp and then you uh, shift the patient uh, even with the pp in a sun which is uh, uh, very hot and humid weather uh, and also the patient but uh, the patient got retrieved from the other hospitals the challenge number 2 uh, what we face a case of myocarditis early myocarditis it settled it it existed with pneumonia so this kind of uh, echo you will found uh, in otherwise a normal uh, 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 patient uh, uh, when you are putting on ecmo you will found the patient is hypotensive and this kind of lv uh, uh, dysfunction the lv uh, uh, looks like it's a 25 to 30% ejection fraction so and you have a high uh, prop i and the antiproban p level so uh, this myocarditis should be kept in mind and this this can lead to your conversion from vv to uh veno arterial for the cardiac support also and challenge number 3 even on day one i was telling that even on day 9 on ecmo this kind of x ray with high il6 more than 5000 your d dimer is 10000 and your patient is having uh, uh, because fever is not there your patient is having tachycardia and all these things and you are it, uh, this kind of so you are using cytosol so this is cytokine storm is very much unique in the covid scenarios on ecmo the challenge number 4 there are some patients who are not improving with recurrent proning so what you do what you do to them you keep on proning them until something settles down you keep tracheostomy and take out or sometimes it happens after second third proning got improved but after fourth and fifth proning the improvement was not sustained and there is a decrease in your pf ratio so what we do we check and uh, uh, we uh, put a patient on ecmo after the fifth proning where uh, everything was not improving and uh, uh, it was a otherwise unstable uh, patient where put on ecmo he was doing fine but uh, we lost him due to a massive intracranial hemorrhage so this can happen to you uh, even uh, uh, because there is a sudden changes of co2 in the brain and which uh, and everybody knows that paper came out that uh, this co2 changes in the brain uh, on ecmo can lead to the uh, intracerebral hemorrhage scenarios so this is another uh, uh, challenge we faced the last challenge i can show you the uh, patients are mostly the huge patients the huge bmi patients are all kind of failures they have a severe pneumonia as acute renal failure yet covid and cephalopathy so you put them on ecmo huge patients and you see that i am decanulating the patient with proper pp even after the patient is negative and we are taking out the uh, uh, proper decanulation so you have to keep in mind the decanulation is as important as your cannulations and with this kind of covid and cephalopathy patient is uh, uh, moving but he is not looking at you and all this we have to wait for 15 days till his cerebral function came uh, okay fine and obviously uh, this is the end of the study and the uh, yeah, the ecmo there is an ecmo card study is going on we have to uh, put some data on them they are requesting us if anybody is interested we can uh, go for a critical care consortium and this is the one and always uh, don't forget to take pictures when they uh, uh, go out and because always you work hard and the party should be harder than that thank you Thank you, Dr. Arpan, for uh, a nice presentation and a detailed uh, discussion on ECMO. I think uh, some questions are coming up. Uh, we can take it at the end of the session as well. Uh, 
I mean, one important question uh, what I've seen is that what is the cost, average cost of ecmotherapy for so suppose 10 days in an adult patient in Calcutta? Many people want to know it because obviously when they are referring patients for ECMO, they have to tell the patients and their relatives. So uh, do you want to answer uh, to that? So uh, just cost, I can tell you this, uh, uh, the cost of uh, the circuit, which uh, the US FDA approval is for 14 days. You can run it for 14 days. At least 10 to 14 days, you can run. The cost of the circuit is 2.2 lakhs. And uh, uh, because it's a heparin coated circuit and lasts longer. And if you add the cannula cost, it scalps comes around 2.5 lakhs. So it is the basic uh, installation cost for an ECMO. On a running cost, uh, what we charge as a 20,000 per day extra, which includes some ABGs and the uh, ACTs and APTTs, which are included. So if you run a 10 day ECMO, uh, the cost is not more than uh, 4 lakhs for ECMO purpose. But and if then the early, yeah. it's still cost. Uh, uh, this is the medicine. So, yes. uh, um, Dr. Shimon Jha, he's saying excellent work, both of you, to, to you and Dr. Shashwati as well. And Dr. Shapta Banerjee, he wants to know uh, what are the centers and how many ECMO uh, beds or ECMO machines we have got in Cal Calcutta. You know, do you any idea on that? How many, what is our capacity yes, yes. in the city? Shako, uh, we have 15 uh, ECMO machines in Kolkata. Okay. And, uh, and that's currently, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a concern. Yeah, that's a concern regarding the ventilators also. Now we are running out of ventilators. Yeah, and as we have seen that uh, the surge in uh, COVID-19 cases in last two, one, two, two weeks is being over overwhelming. I mean, our emergencies are full. No hospital in Calcutta is able to give ICU beds. What beds you still, uh, you know, can make available, but ICU beds uh, are not available across the city. And I know about Apollo, I know about Amri, and definitely America, and other RMT, uh, Bellevue, everywhere it is full. Almost the ICU, especially. So that is one another thing. I mean, I think uh, you know we can discuss later on with Dr. Panja and Dr. Kaur as well uh, regarding how uh, many actually ventilators we have, uh, you know, capacity in Calcutta, especially in private hospitals. Um, so uh, no other questions at the moment, but I would uh, like to ask you one question uh, from my side. Is that you know, we have seen two, three things which uh, works in COVID in my and uh, our experience. One is definitely proning. Proning helps. And if proning doesn't help you, then obviously the answer is ECMO. So obviously we want to catch them early also. So what, how many times do you think that we should try proning on how many days? Uh, even, you know, the criteria is there, like 0.6, uh, they said FIO2 for six hours. So, Five or uh, three hours, but then uh, suppose with one cloning they have improved slightly, and you want to you know see another one uh, the next day. So what is is there any gui guideline or criteria regarding that uh, timing of ECMO uh, decision? So no, uh, actually we are very much clear on these kind of guidelines because a lot of calls come us to uh, uh, the patient is on ventilator for ten days uh, and now he's not improving. What you should do? So there is a clear cut guideline of seven days. If the uh, ventilation is less than seven days, the patient can be put on ECMO. If it is more than seven days, the likelihood of benefit of ECMO is not there. So we should put a line of seven days. And I think the uh, uh, third after the third proning, we should not put uh, the patient on uh, uh, another proning uh, attempt where he is not improving. Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll see if there are other questions, uh, and we can take them at the end of the session. Now we have got none other than Dr. Arindam Kaur, my friend Arindam, uh, to talk on uh, ECMO management. Uh, sorry, management of COVID patients, including extracorporeal therapies. So uh, Arindam needs no introduction in IC ICCM circuit and ESICM circuit, and in Calcutta especially. So over to you, Arindam. You've got a nice beard and uh, new look, I can see. Hello?
ডিসকাশন অ্যাবাউট আওয়ার সেল সো দ্যাট উই ক্যান হেল্প ইচ আদার এন্ড অল আদার থিংস সো ইফ ইউ ইফ তন্ময় এলাউ এলাউজ মি রাদার দেন পুটিং সাম স্টেল uh presentations or something at that sort so i thought that i will bring up some certain relevant uh, discussion points which we all are facing and we can help each other in terms of uh, obviously extra corporeal support uh, as well as in terms of uh, the covid management right now uh, may i have the permission of both iscm secretary and uh, the moderator of the session Sure, sure. Uh, I, I think please, you have got to your own style of uh, discussion and presentation, so please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the first thing I want to uh, all, uh, put an open forum discussion, open forum comment. I think Orpon is also online, right? Uh, and Orpon, are you all online? Yeah, yeah, fine. Tell me. Okay. Uh, okay. So the, the idea is if all the viewers and listeners, everyone are there, the, the idea is that uh, now there is a Mamta Banerjee started it. There are 10 ECMO machines and she can afford ECMO, but uh, not the doctor's proper uh, remuneration. That's a separate story, right? Well, government can offer ECMO, but those ECMOs are uh, still not uh, in a situation to be used. And they, they, it was more of an announcement. But after that, the lockdown happened. And I, I think Arpon will also agree with me. They had not been delivered because the cargo and all others are almost stuck. So it was more of an announcement than of a uh, official implementation. Right at this moment, we have, uh, I think Arpon, you are having three machines, right? Yes. Amri is having one. Uh, Bellevue has just ordered one, which would be another one. five and uh, and and maybe apollo is uh, apollo and rnt will have one each am i correct no, no, rnt rnt is two rnt has got two machines two and uh, and apollo has one if i'm not wrong apollo yes, one yes, apollo has one apollo one so approximately seven to eight machines to to some extent for almost uh, one crore population So that is that is that 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 is a very big part of uh, our discussion that whether it this would be eventually for the vvips or for the someone who can afford it more that that part right so this is and and this should not be like the jailalita case where she was put on ecmo after she have had all thing everything lost almost 50 minutes or 1 hour of cardiac arrest something like that so that point has to be taken we should choose proper patients and uh, our pond did a excellent uh, deliberation as well very clarified uh, things were given that it should be early and this is a gut feeling right or pond that when it has to be started no one can give you an a and should not be treated as a last resort but maybe a uh, a proper clinician a very experienced clinician will identify that this people this person is eventually would require an ecmo but here is a catch in 
in covid situation uh, and uh, what is happening is that this covid is not behaving like a proper ards you are coming with an absolutely bad lung in a normal non covid situation that person wouldn't have any chance to survive or improve without a proper uh, without a prolonged support be it a gentle ventilation or be it a prolonged uh, ecmo support but these people i have seen are improving within days after receiving a timely tocilizumab steroid and plexen therapy right do you agree with me dr paja tonmoy you must have seen so many patients and you have yes. seen some wonderful recovery yes yes some patients are yes some patients are improving very quickly as well uh, but uh, those who are going on ventilator uh, and going on ecmo they are taking longer to recover but many patients who have seen looks like going on ventilator uh, today tomorrow and then uh, tocilizumab and with other therapies they have improved quickly so i have so, seen so my kind of quick my question was agree. my question was to both you arpan and dr panja itself is that if i see a very bad lung very almost 90% with the highest amount of score in the ct scan and others and i am mentally myself and the patient relatives for ecmo itself and luckily the patient gets improved within first 12 to 24 hours so what i have also been gathering information from everyone so if your patient actually starts improving within few very quick few hours of uh, giving the tocilizumab and combination of steroid right i think that is a very good indication that the patient is definitely on the way and in fact if you see the people who are i, I have had a detailed discussion with people from amdavad mumbai delhi who are right and left using the uh, the tocilizumab they are saying that the patients are immediately reporting back that i am feeling good the, uh, the very good subjective feedback that i am feeling good and i am i am i am doing well so that part is also an uh, important indicator that the patient might improve out of it so and the other part what i am finding out i think uh, orpon uh, and dipanjan came here twice in our institution and find out found out there are a lot of patients who are eventually improving we are, we are successful in not putting them on ventilator uh, a, a new concept of venti bipap has emerged we are we are managing them on bipap delivered by a ventilator itself where you can uh, give fio to of 100% that part is also a new concept and it is working very well but somehow they are stuck in between right and they are requiring a prolonged period of rehabilitation sometimes we are frustrated with that hfnc is going on and going on even with the hfnc moisturizing they are starting having nasal crusting and bleeding and for weeks they are on hfnc support and you cannot come down with the oxygen so whether there is any indication of a short term extra corporeal support for this sort of patient or upon what do you think see uh, my uh, uh, another my take is uh, a bit different see you are continuing this hfno support when the patient is not having any second organ uh, problem as as the second organ is getting uh, uh, in a trouble like what tonmada sometimes refers uh, that he was doing on uh, very good on like 45 po2 with uh, 80% but he is showing some acidosis and his urine output is going down i think that is the point where we should intervene he needs uh, ventilation or he needs it but he if he is running without any second organ being affected i think you are actually quite right to continue them on hfnc for maybe two weeks uh, to get them out i am in favor of hfnc with uh, with a single lung in, uh, involvement but not with the your creatinine is rising your uh, is obtunded or his liver is not doing okay or he is having uh, some myocardial dysfunctions one day i am telling you one thing uh, the patient i have seen one patient who was put on self proning and he was doing well suddenly he had an arrhythmia so we did an echo and we found there is a ongoing myocardial disease started so on some myocarditis has happened so we have to we put them on ventilator and we treated them so 
the second organ should be should not the second organ involvement should not be spared as a uh, uh, therapy for hf this prolonged hfn you can continue it the patient is wide awake he's bit of happy hypoxic he is not breathless on hfno but his saturation is between 85 to 90 or it is 80 but accepting anything this is fine you can prolong it for 3 weeks i don't have my mind because the second organ should not be affected with this kind of uh, low oxygenation uh, is uh, arindam uh, there i can't see him at the moment yes sir yeah i'm disconnected uh then i i will uh, probably ask dr paja as well his uh, opinion I mean, we have seen as arpan was saying uh, and arindam was talking earlier see i think uh, in covid situation uh, what we have seen is that it's not like an h1n1 or like a, a ards with h1n1 or other viral pneumonia where it is predictable the problem with covid is very much unpredictability we have seen patients improving very early quickly on uh, with tocilizumab or some other therapies on hfnc or going out of uh, coming out of ventilator very quickly in few days time but many patients we have also seen deteriorating very fast like i have seen uh, in the evening hfnc support patient is self proning to the next day morning early morning i hear that patient had a cardiac arrest So, so those uh, things are also happening i mean uh, the predictability uh, i think we are, as with time we will get more wiser on this but this unpredictability is very much there for covid patients uh, i do want to uh, sort of highlight on that i mean uh, as of uh, data we have seen uh, the mortality rate on ventilator across europe and even uk i have seen uh, been told that went uh, high much higher much higher more than 50% mortality same we are seeing here also and even on icmo the mortality rate uh, you know is there but uh, what we have seen is that the unpredictability very much some patients are getting sick very quicker some patients are improving quickly also and some are taking long time to recover tanmay I, uh, I, I just uh, uh, just my uh, uh, bit of experience or whatever I have gathered from the different side. I think what uh, Orindam actually raised that issues. I think very pertinent issue actually. Actually, uh, to bedside a patient who is deteriorating, we have given a immune modulator. So right now you can consider two aspect. One is patient is improving relatively faster. so i hope that is the time when you can stay away from other modalities of therapy but a group of patient they may not have that that good response and or sometimes that desired response what you can expect so if you allow the patient to continue with the very hfno or patient is with a respiratory rate of 40 45 so i think that is a time when we should take a call okay then you can prone side everything you can do but even with that patient is not improving in that group i am in favor of little in favor of if necessary don't allow it put the patient on ventilator and side by side if with the ventilator also as dr arpan was discussing a bit put uh, what's egmo what is the, what are the advantages actually what i am telling if there is no desired response rather than prolonging the hfno allowing the patient to be that 35 40 50 rate so that can induce further organ damage as well as your lung damage in the form of spontaneous lung injury so that spontaneous like really that spontaneous patient induced lung injury is also a major factor so i think i am little early to go for the your if your uh, this thing means according to the response not good patient is very tachypneic not improving with defined spontaneous okay patient uh, proning so that is the time when we can go for the relatively early intubation as well as for the ecmo also i will try to give a rest to the lung rather than okay prolonging too many too long because timing is the essence of this whole uh, story so that may i i this is a perceptions and not that i have tried in each and every cases but this is a kind of experience as well as my understanding from different uh, interacting with different colleagues yeah Yes, Arinda yeah. wants to say something. Yeah, the idea is I always have a different view. You know that I'm a very true, bong argumentative bong and all others on this part. I was thinking, in fact, Dipanjana and I had a orphan wasn't there. We had a long discussion 
that uh, this awake ECMO is a long concept, right? Uh, particularly people who are waiting for heart lung transplant and all others, they go through an awake ECMO sort of concept. And in those patients, many of the times you don't need to ventilate the patient. You just have to some sort of BiPAP or oxygen support. Do you do you think that this COVID particular situation, the concept of awake ECMO would be very, very uh, uh, useful? In fact, uh, putting on ventilator, maybe whatever reason it is, right? Maybe we have not understood the pathophysiology. Maybe the more problem is on the pulmonary hypertension or widespread pulmonary thrombosis. That is the rather problem rather than the lung itself. That somewhere or other ventilation is not helping. Another practical point is that uh, many of the places people are ventilated much less because now that by this time we have a very pre-approved notion that putting on a ventilator you will have a 100% mortality or the monitoring is not that good and you don't get people who do the proning or go, go and uh, check the ventilation status change the other things and all others not everyone is blessed like your team that you have 15 consultants to take care of right so this is a situation do you think orpon uh, awake ECMO is a possibility in, in this situation uh, see, I'm, uh, that is the uh, big question. Actually, you have uh, you are very much keen on that. But uh, for an awake ECMO, you need a cooperative patient for a cannulation, and uh, that has to be really early so that the patient is not that uh, tachypneic or not that uh, uh, restless uh, that he will allow you to put two cannulas. And obviously, the awake ECMO we prefer this uh, femoro-femoral uh, uh, things. Like in uh, veno arterial, where, where the patient is waiting for the transplant, or we put two femoral femoral. Uh, that is the best technique. So I think that if you consider the patients on awake ECMO, it is pre. Uh, uh, it has to be very much early, and uh, the thing is has to be there. Uh, a patient should not be at the age of your intubation, and you are thinking of uh, awake ECMO. It is not. Patient is very much breathless, and you are thinking of awake ECMO. It is not. Patient is hypoxic even with all these things. The patient can understand, and you are putting uh, cannulas, and you just avoid the intubation. The awake ECMO, I think, is uh, is an option. But for our consensus guidelines, what we have written over there, awake ECMO has uh, uh, two, three staff-related uh, uh, issues. If the patient is awake and uh, you are handling all this, there is a chance of this uh, aerosol generating this uh, cough and all these things. But probably, eventually, this concept will come that if you put an awake ECMO, the patient uh, uh, may uh, recover from this kind of ventilator associated lung injury and it is possible. But you have to refer uh, to the ECMO consultant pretty early that, that I am giving tocilizumab. If it is not improving, you put him on ECMO and I am ready to wait for uh, the things to. That's my point. And the second point is that we have seen all of us are treating people all over the world, particularly in Kolkata, I'm constantly taking feedback that we have avoided ventilation in many pa pa patients, but still we have not been able to have lung injury in this situation. So that is my question that uh, is the lung injury, whether ventilation is uh, uh, contributing to it or not, or whether it is happening, irrespective of we are ventilating the patient. That is my point. Tonmoy, what is your take on this? No, I think uh, a very important question, but uh, the thing is that people, uh, patients who are tachypneic. What is the thing the lung uh, injury, uh, risk of lung injury is there, even if it's continuous breathing and who are very much tachypneic. And uh, if you think about awake ECMO, my question is that how to select them? I mean, I think you know what Arpan was saying. If you select them early, what will be the criteria? Because uh, see, you have to be uh, confident that this patient uh, will cooperate uh, as well as you have to have a criteria which patient to test early. Because PF ratio, they have said 0 0.6, 0 0.5, whatever. But if they are maintaining on HFNC, uh, say, saturation of 80-85% uh, to 90%, and you want to uh, select them for uh, awake ECMO, which are the group, how do you go about it, how to select it, that is a big question. So, uh, obviously, lung injury uh, happens more on patients who are, uh, who are on ventilator, especially spontaneously breathing. 
but we don't allow that for a covid patient to go in ventilator to use an md i mean my experience has been that patients going on ventilator they are needing longer duration of unovascular blockage than normal patients this brings up the question about how different it is in terms of outcome from uh, normal ARDS, other ARDS patient, non-COVID ARDS and COVID ARDS or COVID lung. How different it is in terms of physiology as well as outcome. That is a very important uh, question. We don't uh, know the answer, but we have seen that the pathophysiology is slightly different than non-COVID ARDS. The other part, uh, Orpon, can you please elaborate? You have done seven cases and you must have all the uh, information from the ESLO society, their information are trickling in that uh, while, while on the extracorporeal circuit, what is the uh, what is the impact on the pharmacokinetics of the drug itself, particularly if you are uh, putting on an ECMO and then maybe in many cases you have already tried tocilizumab and um, by that time uh, you are putting the patient on ECMO, the patient has already received and also remdesivir. But I'm just curious about the pharmacokinetics of the drugs itself, specific drugs for COVID. Any data? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, 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 the study has uh, been there. Obviously, it is not possible. Yeah, it, 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 it's possible. not possible. Just anecdotal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, it is irrespective of the drugs. Uh, the uh, lipid soluble and the water soluble drugs has to be uh, give in a uh, uh, into 1.5 to 2 times dosage in every patients of ECMO. Like meropenem, we give 2 gram TDS. This kind of thing. And if you give vancomycin, the volume of distribution initial dosage is higher, and then you keep uh, a, uh, the regular dosage so that uh, that maintains your uh, actual concentrations. But I'm afraid of uh, this tocilizumab and the remdesivir because one of my patient is now getting that remdesivir, who is 120 kg. I'm giving 100 remdesivir and on ECMO. So his volume of distribution has really has gone uh, like anything. Right, so I was yeah. thinking, yeah, I was thinking giving uh, uh, every day 200 remdesivir would have been option, or I should not at all use the remdesivir because what remdesivir will do? It will decrease only decrease the replication of the virus, and the patient is already on ECMO receiving organ support. Whether the inflammatory storm has already been set in by the virus. Been set in. So whether, the remdesivir, whether this remdesivir is going to help uh, it out or not. So that's a question for me. Obviously. I, I think we should send a very clear message to whosoever is uh, listening. Is that yes. the antiviral therapy, plasma therapy, these are all on the early phases. All right? early phases, yes. So, yes. Already and, and people are approaching us like that. Okay, my dad is now almost on the dying phase, please give remdesivir, it will work like wonders. So I think we need to be very clear on, on this part, spread the message that it has to be on the earlier. And also if you have a very high viral load, because we are not estimating viral load. We yes, don't yes. Patients oh, yes. would be requiring remdesivir and others. By the time, if you see the average days, the patients are reporting or coming to the hospital is almost on the ninth day, eight to yes. nine. So by the time the viral replication is already there and people are coming to the hospital only because the inflammatory storm is just beginning and they are starting to feel breathless and that's why they are reporting to the hospital. Most of the time the practical issue is uh, that the little bit of fever, they're staying back. Most of them are afraid to report to the hospital because whether police will take, they are not doing the test. By the time they're uh, getting breathless, doing the test, coming to the hospital is almost on the ninth and 10th day. And most of the antivirals maybe are not effective by that time. So this is the actual practical situation. I think ECMO definitely has a role for, for obviously whoever can afford it. Uh, and I am very, very keen on the, on the ECMO. I, I, I'm sure Orpon and Tonmoy, you will show the path of maybe first time in India itself. Right. Uh, and to some extent, and I think it would be very helpful. I, I think this idea is not won't be bad to go ahead with. And also uh, regarding uh, one last thing from my end is that uh, using BiPAP through a ventilator. I think do you agree that is doing a wonderful job? Any one of you? 
I think, see, uh, uh, doing bypass through ventilator, uh, yes, that is doing a better job than normal bypass machines because these patients are needing high oxygen. Uh, you can then, dial in the uh, perfect uh, FIU2. Yeah. Yes, yes. Number two is that it is safer for the healthcare uh, workers also, for the doctors and nurses, because you're doing, putting two filters. Hmm. So uh, that is safer. The aerosol, whatever is generating, you are trying to minimize it. Unless but, there is uh, a leak, yeah. Unless there is a big yeah, leak. Yeah, unless, unless, there, is, unless there is a big leak uh, there. So that is also safer. So th that is probably, I think, uh, is important. Uh, initially, I would say that we are a bit hesitant to use BiPAP CPAP. Uh, 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 we have been more uh, in favor of HFNC and NRBM mask and normal oxygen. But more and more, we are moving to a uh, venti BiPAP or venti PAP, whatever, uh, non invasive with a ventilator. But uh, Arindam, you and Dr. Panja are there and other people are there, juniors also uh, hearing other colleagues. I've got two or three questions which are important. I am facing the problem. We have man spoken about uh, the ventilation management, ECMO and all that. But the drugs, medicines, obviously, as we know, there is not many uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, randomized trials regarding the drugs in COVID. But uh, one by one, we all agree probably tocilizumab works if you select the patients early and you know you can give on time. IL-6, uh, you know, the turnover time for IL-6 reporting is a bit higher, uh, say 24, 48 hours. So uh, sometimes you have to give it before waiting for IL-6. So tocilizumab, I think all agree that it probably has some benefit works in our selected cases. But what about the other drugs like, uh, you know, flaviflu? Uh, flu? Would we use them in patients who are at home pre-admission? Because you said remdesivir, we are not able to get also. There's a big supply problem. Same with tocilizumab, supply problem. We are not getting it for last two, uh, three days. Uh, so Maharashtra has taken all the uh, shipment that arrived in Mumbai. And they are not letting anybody any, go to anybody else, anywhere else. So what are the drugs? No, 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 the other issue of my uh, because I am I'm trying to get this for, for the entire uh, city itself. Uh, that the, the other problem which has started, now people have understood that this is a life-saving drug and the stockpiling has started. People are stocking it up. That maybe I will require it one day or other. So stockpiling has happened. So th that is also another reason. And the other reason is Kolkata has stopped even the cargo flights from Mumbai and Delhi. So that the ships are not coming. So this is a big issue which are coming. I, today I had almost seven patients out of which three definitely need, will die without procedure. And we had to bargain it that we are now using that your subcutaneous uh, preparation, which in fact, the both Mumbai and Delhi colleagues have said that it has worked. So the dosage is that you use to, it comes in a pack of four pre-filled syringes. You use two syringe at one time and no consideration you repeat it after 12 hours so this is a standard doses total two plus two, but approximately. It's, it's, yeah two plus two yeah what, what, but what is the milligram dose it's not 600 milligram like the iv dose it's a different no, it, comes it's, it comes it comes to 162 162 yeah. milligram uh, uh, ml. precisely yeah per per uh, 0.9 ml so two dosage at one shot and mandatory two uh, dosage after 12 hours so you here you don't look for a clinical improvement or deterioration to uh, sort of uh, uh, decide for the second dosage. Here the second dosage is mandatory. And as we are speaking, I think uh, the debate has again started now whether the E2CZ map would be also eligible now, for that. So I think this is a more of a... Uh, now, uh, question is that, say, you, you, you don't have trusted the map. Would you... Well, suppose uh, we don't have tocilizumab uh, in stock at the moment. Would you use cytosol or immunostatin? What about you, triple immunostatin or cytosol? If you are not having tocilizumab in your stock, in I your think uh, Medi <coughs> Medica yourself is leading the way in the COVID treatment as of now. So we, you have used more cytosol than us. I have used cytosol. Uh, in fact, in one patient, I have used both tocili and cytosol. So the idea is one is an upstream uh, biomarker containment. So tocilizumab, steroids, these are preventing 
uh, the biomarkers to go up and all others wherein uh, plasma pheresis uh, high volume hemofiltration cytosol these are downstream regulation of biomarkers itself so they can complement each other in fact you can have both or you can choose one i think the next step would be that if tocilizumab is not available so eventually we will fall back on this uh, and if you are using both my one suggestion is that there should be a gap of 48 hours before the, your last dose of tocilizumab because tocilizumab can be removed or absorbed yes, in the cytosol itself so that is one important aspect of thing uh, but i think the way it has given a uh, the dramatic improvement right we would be all coming up with our uh, uh, sort of observations post covid once we, if we survive of all of us so none of the immunomodulators have shown this dramatic response so that is that is definitely definitely a big point to be noted so i am a very big fan of uh, tocilizumab as of now uh, let's see uh, what the eventual data comes and regarding your what other, about uh, there is a new another drug available tocilizumab tocilizumab I, I, I was just telling it that uh, whether it was it is a poor man substitute if if amitabh bachchan is not available let's take mithun chakravarti if mithun not available or have not affordable let's take govinda whether it is like that uh, it has been very hastily said and uh, and only one trial has come up i was just discussing because i am desperate right now three of my patients will definitely die if i don't give uh, and uh, so i i called up everyone who so have used uh, so i found out only one trial had happened and there were almost 12 patients they have published it is not a trial it's just a case series sort of thing they had uh, more or less acceptable outcome out of it but what they had found is that almost 9 out of 12 patients had secondary infection so whether that is a, a point of concern here uh, we we need to hear. so i have resisted myself to use it i am looking for more information and if so i will share with it to you because this is someone uh, must provide us some more useful information before jumping on it it could be a desperate attempt if tocilizumab is not available in coming 48 hours right uh, because all the stocks are almost exhausted in in kolkata itself so it could be a desperate attempt but i am i am not sure about it last two questions uh, to dr panja and you uh, first of all uh, if you would you use unilastatin you trip if you don't have anything else Truly speaking, regarding ulinastatin, I don't have uh, knowledge, means your uh, experience in using that. What I have uh, heard from my colleagues, if there are, say, suppose, uh, kind of a patient with some of the people used to follow that, if there is hypotension or sepsis with shock type of features that is developing, so they have used it. The about the results, they told that uh, immediately to conclude it will be difficult. But personal experience is not there about using the uh, ulanestatin in this uh, COVID sepsis. And uh, what and was what, the what, 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 what about what about poor man's remdesivir? You know, favifavir, faviflu. Right. What about using uh, that if you are not having remdesivir? Uh, immediately, I truly speaking, I cannot make any difference between the remdesivir and favipiravir because the experience is very very limited. Right now, I have one patient, say, suppose that patient also responded to what I don't know. I had given steroid, patient was on non-invasive ventilation, not improving, rather deteriorating that point. I had to consider the pavipiravir on the day 9, actually. It is a bit, yeah. uh, no, sorry, day 8, okay. So, at uh, that time, I had no other option because he started deteriorating from the 6th day onwards. So, flavipiravir I had given. Anyway, today is right now 13th day. Patient is improving. Patient is being shifted to the ward. So, is it uh, yes, by chance or yeah, very difficult? There was another casting match. <laughs> now, now so, the question is about that the, about and the question... remdesivir, what I can convey, uh, truly speaking, as Orindamo has also pointed out, and Dr. Orpon also, most of our patients they are coming by 6th or 7th day. So it is really very difficult whether these drugs are really uh, the time when we should consider at the seventh, eighth day or not. So it is a bit maybe uh, relatively late. So 
there should be a some kind of PA that on the particular day if we are using, if we are not using, so that type of PA should be there. Because there is no other evidence, no other year, still our, we are in a learning phase, so that people, people are using. So very difficult, but I am not very hopeful about the remdesivir also, truly speaking. Yes, I mean, so my, uh, my strategy Tonmoy, is that you start an antiviral, particularly which is affordable and which is not that costly. Uh, if, if you say so, favipiravir may be mild to moderate. When you get the first phone call, right? Keep a prescription ready. Send it to the send it to the patient who is calling you up because by that time that patient eventually gets admitted to you. It's late. So give all your antiviral when you get the first phone call. I think okay, so. I okay, think I'm so. started to having a fever. Yes, uh, prop, uh, yes. yes. Or, uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I, I, I am agreed with you. <laughs> I mean, because initially this lopirito, lopirito combinations were using, that is also the same way, you know. Uh, we used quite a lot of lopirito, actually. <laughs> quite a lot of we, are, we, are, uh, we shifted to remdesivir, now the, we don't have stock of remdesivir, now we are trying to shift to supply. Should I comment one thing? Actually, uh, because even if you don't treat 80 to 85 percent anyway, percent of patient will improve. So it is very difficult on a phone call or on a call that who, who now you have to give something, Dr. Paja, you have to give something, otherwise the phone call won't stop. That is also an important very, very, no, real, also, very difficult. Also, also the thing is that even a hospitalized <laughs> patient, you have to give something because the patient yeah, yeah, the, the you, have, you have called up you have, he has called up one of the great internists, and if you say don't take anything, right? <laughs> where, is, where is the GP is giving you the pavipiral? <laughs> Right. How, how do you how do you justify? So, that? Yeah, we, yeah. Are, we are giving uh, vitamin C and ginkgo fit and SQS. So, hey, I, 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 I am more of a market, marketing yeah. strategy than actually evidence <laughs> strategy. <laughs> now, and uh, on a, on a serious note, see, see, uh, this is the desperate time. So, lot of people with a business agenda and others, they are coming up with huge amount of pay. So, be it a vaccine, be it a immunomodulator, modulator, and ulinastatin, I think every time there is a crisis, ulinastatin tries to come up and say, okay, I am, I am useful. So, that is, that is this is amazingly, they have started sepsis, pancreatitis, burns, uh, all sort of a, uh, your toxic epidermal necrolysis, SSTS, everything. Now, they are saying that we are useful. I think it is, this is not that. Uh, uh, we should be very uh, restricting ourselves to support any sort of this sort of. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I have got some questions uh, from the audience. Huh. So, first of all, Dr. Chunki Dr. Madam. Chunki Madam is asking uh, that whether uh, there is any experience with acetyl system and uh, whether it helps. And also, uh, she's asking uh, to all, how, how many of your patients' pH and any experience of nitric oxide have we used here? We, I have not used in Medica. I don't know I mean, if you have any idea that has anybody used. Nitric oxide, I think I was just trying to say, put this point, because I'm routinely measuring the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And Medica had been kind enough to lend their nitric oxide. But unfortunately, uh, this is for everyone's information. The nitric oxide that is available in Kolkata, both to you, Apollo, and, and some other, and also RNT, I think, the nitric oxide is there. The system is enabled that this can be only given to neonates and infants. For adults, you need a f almost 45, 50 lakhs of investment, a special equipment, and others. Uh, otherwise, it is, it is not possible. Then I inquired everywhere that whether nitric oxide be useful in fact in uk and us they are in very very difficult cases where the systolic pressures are more than 80 and not coming down with, with all sort of efforts nitric oxide has been given i have had three patients who had persistently pulmonary artery systolic pressure measured with a rarv dysfunction more than 100 in fact i called up uh, dr panja one day and and we started ambisultan and tadalafil and i told this patient there was a huge dead space created. The hypoxia was corrected. I was unable to bring down the PCO2 below 90. So we did our first ECOR here and along with the, uh, this sort of uh, medication Tadalafil because I could not use this nitric oxide. Unfortunately, the patient died, but uh, it is a big learning. 
that a lot of times we are not measuring pulmonary artery systolic pressure. There is a hidden pulmonary hypertension in this sort of patient because of widespread thrombosis. Regarding N acetylcysteine, I am using routinely as an oral or IV format because there are certain trials, very small trials though, they are showing and theoretically it is also a plausible explanation has been given that how it is working and in fact if you are brave enough to produce aerosol in your, in your uh, unit if you are protecting your healthcare worker, a combination of xylocard, N acetylcysteine, Mr. Bronx, and to some extent beta agonist had been used in certain age because that mobilizes and improves the alveolar so that is also a, a thought for food for thought that you can you can imply okay now my uh, the other uh, question from the forum uh, i put to that panja uh, uh, it is regarding the plasma therapy, whether we can give it outside clinical trial as per the Ministry of Health government guidelines, whether we should try it. Uh, regarding plasma therapy, couple of days before actually uh, our Dr. Saurabh Maji, actually he clearly, basically he mailed to ICMR about the use of the plasma therapy. Is there any licensing required or not? He had asked that. From the ICMR, the response was, that is with me also. The response was that right now the government of India with the ICMR's recommendation has given it as off-level indication. That indication should be clearly, you should discuss with the patient's family as well as patient. And if your blood bank has that facility to take the plasma with the same blood group and that patient otherwise fulfilling, the donor is fulfilling the criteria for that year, so then you can go ahead. But that all the documents should be should be mentioned in the file. There is no need to take any special permission from any authorities. That was the answer from the ICMR. And about the Delhi, Delhi, what I have gathered information in Delhi last uh, actually our webinar that was in the plasma therapy on the Sunday. So Dr. Gongaram Hospital is having a very a good basically program with the plasma therapy. And by the time they had already collected 50 plasma. Uh, donor and already applied that for the 36 patients. So what was their experience, experience, practical experience, they had not taken any permission from anybody. The permission was with the blood bank and second thing what they did, the convalescent plasma after recovery of the patient, after two to three weeks of recovery and those who are, who are clinically suffering the disease, not that they are, they are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. So those patients got admitted to the hospital for relatively moderate to severe degree of the illness, okay, or at least higher side of the moderate or in the, I say, my, my, not mild actually, what I can say, they were telling those who are suffering more than seven days, they had taken the plasma from those group of patients and without measuring the titer that was mentioned in the uh, books. Yeah, because, because, that, because that, that test is not available, no? Uh, that that facilities not available. are not available. Mm -hmm. So they had used that about 200 to 250 ml of the plasma they had collected and they were giving. About the experience immediately they were not in a position to give what was their basically uh, they uh, sent one message that ideally it should be given to the uh, relatively earlier phase not too late. So it may be like similar to the uh, antiviral therapy maybe on the day 7, 8 okay like that time when the patient is going basically not doing well or those patients who are basically having some features of the relatively a bit of organ damage, they are relatively toxic. So mild to moderate cases, they choose that plasma for the treatment. So not that very badly sick. So that and, and, you, and, and you don't need any special permission as long as your blood bank can do aphoresis. Yeah, yeah, you are right. You don't need uh, any special permission for your blood bank. Exactly. Is that right? Okay, so I mean, I think, uh, see, uh, one plasma therapy, according to my estimate, costs around 20,000 to 25,000. So it may be a cheaper option than trastuzumab if it works. We are not, not sure. Costly, but also remdesivir also. Remdesivir. Yeah. So, but we are not sure uh, about, uh, you know, uh, data from the clinical trials will come up. Uh, definitely Calcutta Medical College Blood Bank, uh, they are doing also a clinical trial. Along with uh, ICMR is also doing a clinical trial. Gangaram is doing. So, uh, 
if we give, we should collect data and keep the data for our future uh, sort of reference also. So uh, maybe we we might have to use plasma therapy if the supply of trastuzumab is drying up as a desperate measure. So uh, with that, I think uh, you know, it's time is up. It's seven ten p.m. Uh, I've got comments that uh, from Dr. Jha is a good discussion. Sort of, you know, everyone saying that the discussion was quite in interesting and uh, you know useful. Uh, there was a question uh, regarding uh, or comment rather regarding whether ICCM Kolkata should come up with some guidelines regarding uh, all this, but. I think already government guideline is there. Dr. Panja will decide that whether uh, we need a separate guideline or not. But what my concern is that how we cope with the capacity in the city. Okay, because I am uh, I'm sure every one of us we are almost full in terms of few beds, and still we are getting so many calls. Even doctors, I've got uh, four doctors admitted in last 48 hours, and two on ventilator. So, uh, you know, not to say that, you know, VIPs will get uh, somehow get admitted and get preference in beginning treatment, but then uh, how we manage, you know, for uh, our uh, healthcare workers, for our, all our doctors in terms of bed situation. That is Tanmo, I have a question. Are these doctors are the frontline workers or these are the no. doctors who are not? In, uh, and uh, to be to to be fair, uh, to be fair, uh, many are not the ICU doctors. Most of them are not ICU doctors. I know two of our ICU colleagues, uh, critical care colleagues uh, in Calcutta, they had uh, uh, disease. This just the reference we are uh, getting that we've been any, anyone who anyone who uh, have severe disease. Because my extrapolation, right, or maybe a thoughtful. Uh, a sort of very positive uh, uh, sort of expectation is that a chronic low grade or sort of uh, asymptomatic Excuse infection has rendered us uh, immune. So once our IgG uh, testing starts, I think people who are working constantly in ICU, they are already uh, being either infected or being immune due to a chronic low grade exposure. So what is your thought? What is the forum think about it? I cannot disclose that information, but uh, I think uh, uh, in UK, they tested a lot of doctors and healthcare workers and nurses and most of them IgG were negative. And that is the same experience for us. <laughs> so IgG is negative. But yes, still, yes. if you see, my observation is that the people who are actually going to the patient and in a contact and constantly working, majority of them are not being infected. That's that's yes, yes. Word. I think you are, you are right. We are uh, not seeing that many patients, uh, people affected, Orinam. who are working in uh, ICU PPEs. Orinam, I uh, you are more at risk of getting it in the Mukundapur market or in uh, your Behala yes, yes. Uh, than in the hospital. Orindam, just from a small way, I think it is uh, sometimes that there is more infection maybe in the other group, maybe uh, because of the reason that in the ITU actually we have a right now mindset, okay, always mindset is that treat each and every patient as well as every on the basically interacting with you on your opposite side, consider them as potential COVID because continuously in our, okay, we are working with the COVID as well as when we are interacting with other people also, we are always a bit conscious whether we are with PP or without PP, but we know what to do, what not to do. But I think because there are so many doctors in the last couple of days I have seen, they are actually doing their OPD practice and they got infected. So I don't know what will be the extrapolation. My extrapolation or my thought is that maybe that that was the time when the doctors have not taken their due precaution okay so what kind of precaution that needs your always mindset eh? that you are doing this and you are taking this, this this type of care means sequence of care you should take so that may be the reason and definitely just today i got one here from thyro care suppose they are doing the antibody titer 
with just 600 rupees. So maybe once it is in approved, so that may be tested by the all the all. I, 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 I think I think Metropolis is also doing for 800 rupees. Okay. That, so that maybe that every one, every month we should get it done as per ordering them. We you know. But maybe asymptomatic carriers, asymptomatic uh, uh, infections will not give that much titer of IgG. That is also a possibility in them. Okay. 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 So I think it's. Hello, Dr. Panja, you want to uh, put your concluding remarks, please? Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, all the audiences, as well as our all learned uh, speaker. Dr. Saswati Left, Dr. Orpon, yeah, Dr. Orinam Kaur, as well as our moderator, Dr. Tonmoy Banerjee, to spare this time as well as interacting because Dr. Orpon, Orinam, Tonmoy, Saswati, they are working with really, uh, I think they are almost, uh, in Calcutta, I think they are the best yeah, because they are treating a huge number of COVID patients and their experience as well as interaction is very important. So we will continue to definitely learn from each other. And at the outset, I must thank to the uh, ACP forum for providing this platform. But in particular, Jayati, who is uh, working hard and uh, to basically arrange this program to send the information in time, as well as to collect the speaker with this COVID and to leaving aside that PP is really difficult. So uh, yeah, Jayati has made this possible. So with this, and I think hopefully, uh, at least in the COVID area, we have covered in the last year defined aspect of the COVID. So if there is new updates in, I think in another three to four weeks, we may start with, the, with our uh, new upset or what was the or last one month, uh, how we are going and what are the new advances that can be discussed. And by that time, we will more and more, we will learn from our experience, like Orpon, Orindam, Tonmoy and Saswati about the using the ECMO and what is their experience about using different modes of the ventilation. So with this, I will uh, thanks all of you. And if there is any suggestion here, you can also uh, suggest us through, because uh, Jyoti will send one feedback form also. Please fill up that feedback, feedback form, as well as if you have any specific areas, comments, so that you can forward it. And hopefully, uh, coming month, we will continue to do our the regular clinical uh, that is the clinical that monthly CME. So I think there will be a defined discussion. So we want to come away or stay away from COVID also because not the COVID will stay forever. There are other diseases to discuss. So that we will discuss from the next year also. For us. With this, I will thank you all for being here. Please. Eh? So I would like to thank Dr. Paja, and this is a team effort from HCP Forum that we are undergoing this. Uh, so need your sincere uh, efforts, feedbacks from your end. So please share your feedbacks over mail, and you will also be getting a certificate from ISCCM Kolkata as a token of participation in this uh, wonderful webinar. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, speakers. We are signing off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.